Hello, everybody. I know that if you're watching this lecture, you think you are advanced. This section is really about some of the techniques, tools, tips, tricks that can help you control your type 1 diabetes, but it's really for people that are advanced and already have some basic knowledge of type 1 diabetes. Okay, we'll start off with this important slide. It's all about time and range now. We used to really focus in on the A1C, but time and range represents the percent of time that you are between 70 and 180. And then there's, of course, it's very importantly, there's time below range, and what's left over is time above range. So really, a lot of the techniques that I'm going to talk about are helping you improve your time and range and reduce your time below range. Just to emphasize again, and this is important for you to know, that one hour above 180 or below 70 reduces your time and range 4%. 1% represents 15 minutes. 4% represents one hour. So when you look at your download from your CGM and it says you're below 55, 2% of the time, that means for the length of that download, you are below 55, 30 minutes a day on average. So that's why we try to put the percent into reality. Okay, this is a great slide. I always like showing this to professionals, to people with diabetes, my grandmother, anybody who will listen to me. But if you look at the, the, the two patients, they have the same exact A1C. The top one is going all over the place. Tons of highs, tons of lows. The bottom one's doing pretty darn good. And that's why the A1C is just not that good. It doesn't tell us anything about variability. It, it, it relates to the risk of long-term complications, but when it doesn't tell us anything about hypoglycemia. That upper patient is having tons of hypo, but you just wouldn't know it based on the A1C. Now, I'm not gonna get into some of the medical literature, but you should know that they have equated improved time and range with less eye disease and less kidney disease. Uh, you know, normally most of that data is just the hemoglobin A1C. So it really has lots of impl implications. It's all about time and range. Okay, now, first of all, if you don't have a CGM, this talk's not for you. And I don't wanna put you down, because not everyone has access, can afford it, et cetera, or it may have a nerdy doctor. But these are the main CGM devices, the Dexcom G6, the Freestyle Libre 2, and now the Eversense that just got approved to be 180 days, uh, and that was just a few, approved a few weeks ago. I'm not gonna talk about the G7, it's not available yet, I'm not gonna pop, I'm not gonna talk about the Libre 3, which is not available yet. Now, just to be fair, I am gonna mention the Medtronic Guardian, um, it, it's not used very much. It's got, it's got a lot of issues that, uh, uh, that makes it not the best device. But, um, you know, it, it's certainly better than not having a CGM at all. So here's a picture of the Dexcom G6. As you know uh, or you don't know, you can get the numbers right on your watch, a, a monitor, your cell phone, uh, and if you're using one of the systems, these hybrid closed loop systems that I'm going to talk about at the very end, you can get it as part of those systems as well. And we know it lasts 10 days. It requires no calibration, but you could calibrate if you like. It's got all kinds of alerts and alarms. Uh, and, and, and also, it is the only CGM that is a partner to uh, pump companies for the hybrid closed loop system. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's probably the leader in the field, especially in the area of type one diabetes at the current time. Now, what about the Eversense E3? Just got approved. Um, this is the uh, implantable continuous glucose monitor. That little sensor on the left goes under the skin, usually in the arm, with about a 15 minute procedure. You wear stereo strips for a day and you take them off and then you put the transmitter right over it with this nice uh, double-sided skin tape, and that stays there for the day or two days before you charge it with a USB, and the information goes continuously to the iPhone 
or uh, an Apple Watch. And once again, once you get it put in, it stays there for six months. And people say, well, which one should I get? I said, it's personal choice. Uh, I find a lot of people that just don't want to deal with the insurance and getting the subcutaneous sensors every 10 days and for the Libre two weeks. Others are in the water a lot, etc. So it's, it's totally up to you. Uh, this system, you still need to calibrate once a day. Okay, the Libre 2. Now it has alerts and alarms. It lasts 14 days, doesn't require calibration. Um, it's eventually going to hook up to insulin pumps, not at the current time, but that will come. And the Libre 3 um, is coming and it is an improvement over the Libre 2. And they call the Libre 2 a flash system because the monitor, which this is not it, but it's about the same size, you swipe it over the Libre sensor. So if I have to tell you that, uh, I shouldn't even be talking about that because I forgot, you guys are advanced. Um, okay, now, all of the devices I showed you have very important trend arrows. I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand on that. So important for insulin dosing. And a lot of people don't use their trend arrows to adjust their dose of insulin. And then the alerts and alarms. If you set them correctly, you can really improve your time and range. And I'm gonna show you my technique what I've been telling my patients, and I guarantee you it works. Okay, now I think it's important to go through a CGM download. You all need to look at these things like your doctor looks at these things. And I guarantee you, you probably know more than your doctor, unless you're a really savvy endocrinologist like myself or Dr. Pettis, Dr. Bader, uh, Dr. Santos. So first you wanna look at the, the mean glucose. And I look at these very methodically. The goal is less than 155. Why? 155 equates to an A1C of 7%, which is right here. And we're going to talk about the glucose management indicator in a second. Um, but I like to call it the A1C because in a nutshell, it's more accurate than the laboratory method. Now, what about what I clicked earlier, the standard deviation? Uh, that's important. Uh, and this is, you can see this gentleman, his name is Stephen, spells it with a PH, his parents really messed up, uh, and uh, it's 71. The goal should be less than 50. What is standard deviation? It's how much bounce you get throughout the day. The lower, the better. And just like that one slide I showed you, the patient on top had a lot of variability. The patient on the bottom had hardly any at all. So I look at the mean glucose, the estimated A1C, the standard deviation, and then I look at time and range. Uh, you can see that this patient is 64%. The goal is above 70. And then I look time below range. And this, he's having way too much hypo. He's supposed to have less than 4% in the 55 to 70 range and less than 1% in the below 55. Now, what is this gentleman on? He's a good guy. I, I got to know him when he was in college. He's on an Omnipod and a Dexcom, obviously, and he controls it himself. He's not looping, and he doesn't have the Omnipod 5. So he's not doing too badly, uh, considering you know his average number, his estimated A1C, his time and range is almost 70%, which is the goal, but he's having a lot of hypos, and he's having a lot of variability. And I'll show you his... Uh, uh, download right now. So here it is, the 24-hour profile. It's important to note that the, the 12 midnight is on the left-hand side. And you can see that that's where he's really having a lot of variability. Now, most people, when they go to sleep, they're not doing too much. Now, I mentioned to you, he's young. He, who knows what he's doing at night? But that's the time of the day where he has highs and he has lows. And the rest of the day, he's not doing too badly. So remember, the height of those rectangles, you want them narrow. And I'll show you some more downloads in a second. Now, this part is key, is where does he have, what does he have set for his alerts and alarms? So the first thing is, you know, and he's following my advice. He's, he's doing much better than before. During the day, his upper alert is one. 50. And 
during the nighttime, he wants to be disturbed less often, he changes it to 180. And it, I don't know if you know this, but on your Dexcom, you can have two sets of alerts and alarms, daytime, nighttime, or, or as you, any time of day you want to change it. And I'll tell you what, it, it does take time on my side to convince some patients that you want to make the upper limit 150. Now think about this. If you're trying to improve your time and range, and when you get, if you have your upper limit set at 180, by the time your alert goes off, you're done. You're out of range. So why not be notified early when you're 150 so you can do something to prevent yourself from getting to 180? So now I change my whole attitude. When my CGM goes off at 150, I'm going, yeah. And I, and I look at the trend arrow. If it's straight across, I might not do anything. If it's on the way down, <clears throat> well, you're not, it's not on the way down because you just crossed it going up. But depending on the trend arrow, I would give myself a correction bulls, get out my afresa. I'd, you know, you know, if I'm planning on exercise, I might not do anything. So think about that. Um, so this is a, a patient. This is the same Stephen. And I like to look at the best day. The Dexcom download will give you the best day. So look at this. His time and range is over 94%, very little lows, and his mean glucose is 131. Look at his standard deviation on the lower left, 33. So I know he can do it. And I do like the fact that it gives us a little bit of positive reinforcement. And that's a really important day. I, I, I ask him, what were you doing February 10th of this year? <clears throat> Let me know, you know, whatever you were doing, uh, you might think of some tips and tricks that may help you keep your blood sugars in control. And then don't forget the GMI, I don't know where they came up with this goofy name, glucose management indicator, but what you need to do is look at your average glucose over 90 days. That'll give you the most accurate A1C that you will get, way more accurate from the lab, which is just a laboratory method, could be fraught with errors. If you're anemic, African-American, pregnant, these will make your A1C inaccurate. So that's important for you to know. Now, there is a thing called the ambulatory glucose profile. Uh, the, this, this way of looking at your numbers is on all the CGM devices. It gives you the metrics right here. It gives you the time and range and out of range in the middle, and then over on the right, it gives you the 24-hour profile. And I like to tell the younger doctors and people with diabetes to say, okay, look at three important things. When you're the highest, when you're the lowest, and when is the standard deviation the greatest? Now, when you look at the ambulatory glucose profile, in the lower left under metrics, on the left-hand side, you'll see coefficient of variation, percent CV. That's a different way of looking at variability. And the goal is less than 36. Uh, so remember, they are your friend. We talked about putting your upper limit at 150. Uh, and at night, you can make it higher, as I mentioned. And you can change the alert sound to be a much nicer, palatable sound. Uh, and this, this will improve your average glucose It'll improve your time and range, make it sh smaller, and your A1C value. So you can see I use this thing called Nerd uh, Sound down here. My favorite really is baby crying. You know, I follow Dr. Pettis when he gets below 55. This little baby sound comes on. If you haven't heard it, it's amazing. I wanted to have a soundtrack for you, but sorry. And you've got to change your attitude. You really do. I know so many of you set your alerts so high because you say it drives you crazy, drives your partner crazy. You just got to figure out the levels that will improve your time and range without driving you crazy. Let's talk about trend arrows. I want to show you the study that I did with Dr. Pettis. We took 222 successful CGM users. That means that their average A1C was 6.9. They had no hypoglycemia. What they found was the most valuable using CGM was the real-time trend arrows and the alerts and alarms. What they found least useful is looking at the data in retrospect. So we gave them a scenario. We said, you're not gonna, your blood sugar is 220, straight arrow, uh, trend arrow straight across, and you're not, you're not, you don't have any insulin on board, uh, and you're not gonna exercise or eat for four hours. How much insulin would you give yourself? And the, 
the mean average dose was three units to get down to 120. So what does that mean? It means their correction factor was about one to 33. And so that's pretty typical for a type one. Now we gave them the same scenario, but the only thing we said differently was, look at the trend arrows, not straight across, two arrows up. And then the mean dose that they would correct is 6.8 units. Here's a little more detail. We gave them the scenario and you can see there's the three units, uh, you know, when they're trend arrows straight across, there's the 6.8 with two arrows up. And the mean dose they would give when they had two arrows down was 1.5. But many patients said, I'm not going to give any until the trend arrow becomes horizontal. <clears throat> and you can see that just by the trend arrows, their dose ranged from nothing to 6.8 units with the same 220 two trend arrows going up. So basically, uh, Jeremy and I put together this scale, how you would adjust your insulin. So if your trend arrow was straight across, you would just use your own correction. If your trend arrow was diagonal up, you add 50 to your current number and correct for that. So if your blood sugar was 150 with diagonal up, you'd correct for 200. One arrow straight up, you add 75 to your current number and correct for that. Two arrows up, you add 100 points to your blood sugar at the current time and correct for that total. So if your blood sugar is 250, you with two arrows up, you correct for 350. And then on the way down, you sort of level off and you, uh, uh, you could wait until that trend arrow eventually becomes horizontal. And if it horizontals at 200, then you correct. If it horizontals at uh, 110, you know you're good. Okay, the other thing I'm going to say quickly is you have to make sure your basal dose is set correctly, whether you're using a long basal insulin or a pump. So have an early dinner. Make sure your postprandial glucose is in a desirable range. And then fast till the next morning and see what your blood sugar is. And you should be no more than 30 to 40 milligrams per deciliter different than your bedtime blood sugar. That is key. And if your blood sugars creep up, overnight, then you might need a, a bigger, a, a larger basal. And if you get hypo every time you do that, you're on too much basal. And you may need to do this test more than once, but your basal dose has to be in a good zone. Nothing else will work well if your basal is too high or too low. Don't forget, to JO and Traceba are the new second generation long acting basal insulins. If you're not on pump therapy, you should definitely be on one of these. And I don't take my type twos off older basils unless there's a real reason, but I have proactively switched all my patients with type one who are on multiple daily injections to one of these two basal insulins. They just work better and I get uniformly positive feedback. Now, this is, if you've ever had this, this is what it is, compression. In the middle of the night, your Dexcom goes off, you get below 55, you wake up your partner, you're right in the middle of having intimate moments and then everything's interrupted. You see that little dip right here? That's because you were laying on your sensor. And the FDA requires companies to test for compression. Just wanna let you know that. And it can cause havoc if you don't realize that. Okay. How do you prevent post meals high? A Frezza is key. You know, it works faster and it gets out of your system faster. Uh, it works within 10 minutes and lasts no longer than 90 minutes. You can use it before you eat a meal that's high in simple carbohydrates with, with every meal you eat, or you can use it as little as correcting for a high blood sugar. It's one of these uh, discoveries of changing the sub-Q insulin into inhalable, and it's the rare patient that doesn't love it. But I'll tell you what, it's it, not every doctor's heard of it, uh, and sometimes prescribing could be a pain uh, if your healthcare system doesn't know how to prescribe Afrezza, like which pharmacies to use, what paperwork. Just go to the Afrezza website, and they, it'll have a lot of information on the best way that you can help your doctor get you Afrezza. Don't forget, there's the faster-acting aspart, which is faster on and faster off than Novolog, and Lumgev, which is a faster acting Umalog, works a little faster, 
gets out of your system faster. And they're, they're both approved for insulin pump therapy. Now, when it comes to uh, the timing of insulin, it is extremely important. Here's a study where a bunch of type 1s came in, their blood sugar is around 150, and they either ate the meal, took, sorry, they either took their insulin 20 minutes before eating, at the time of the meal, or 20 minutes after eating. And this group right here that had a much better postprandial that did not require correction, took their insulin 20 minutes before eating. I can't tell you how important it is. And uh, you got to figure out ways where you can remember, uh, you know, to do it before you eat. And if you can delay your meal, if you're at home, if it's not that big of a deal, it makes a huge difference in the postprandial rise. Okay, carbs. I'm going fast now because I want to finish in the next three minutes. Okay, it's a great way to go through life as a type one. Not zero carbs, reduce carbs. And if your blood sugars are all over the place and you can't get your insulin dosing right, try it for a week. It can really help you get on track. Uh, and you know, you might find a good regimen that will that you can follow over the long term. So it's it's really a good uh, technique all the time, but especially if your control is terrible and you do eat a lot of regular carbs. Here's just a, a screenshot of some of the stuff I eat that powdered peanut butter, it's not that bad. Cauliflower rice, you know, cheese crackers, uh, beef jerky, egg beaters, nuts. Don't forget, you have Steve's maple sausage scramble. How about Taco Tuesday with lettuce instead of the taco shell? How about Edelman's big ass salad? You know, be careful, that salad dressing, it's awesome, but it's got a ton of calories in it. Okay, fighting the post meal spike, you may need to change your settings. You know, you may need to improve your, change your insulin to carb ratio and your insulin sensitivity factor. That's important. If you're on a hybrid closed loop system, that you may need to change the settings if you're always getting high after eating. Now, I'm not going to speak on these in detail, but we have a whole lecture and we talk about it at the debate with Dr. Earl Hirsch and myself. What is a hybrid closed loop system? This is the future of diabetes care. Pay attention. This is where there's communication between the insulin pump and the CGM device. These systems will give you more insulin as your blood sugar is going up and less insulin as your blood sugars are going down and stop insulin secretion altogether if it predicts you're going to hit a serious lower level. And you have a modulating basal rate all the time, 24 hours a day. And this is why when you get one of these systems, you only have one basal rate. You don't have to worry about secondary basal rates. And th th this automatic insulin delivery that you see with these hybrid closed lip systems, they're all based on your predicted blood sugar from the continuous glucose monitor. It's amazing. And there are settings for exercise, sleep, and other activities. Um, and you still have to put in your carbs. That's why it's called a hybrid closed loop system. A fully automatic closed close loop will be you don't have to enter anything. The other thing is these things work awesome overnight. Look at the blood sugars that come down overnight. And there are four systems. Medtronic 670G, the Tandem Control IQ, the DIY Yourself Looping, and the Omnipod 5. I don't have time to tell you about each nitty gritty hybrid closed loop system, but you really need to look at these. I'll show you a little bit of uh, interesting information about the Tandem Control IQ. It's actually the first uh, hybrid closed loop that where it gives auto boluses every hour if you need it based on your insulin sensitivity factor and your insulin and carbs on board. It's amazing technology and people are doing extremely well with that. Now, what about exercise? So this is another tip. You've got to create settings, no matter what system you're using, and turn them on 60 to 90 minutes before you exercise, such as a lower basal rate, or uh, set your, your system to shoot for higher blood sugars. Secondly, as you're ending your exercise, you should probably put those settings back to normal 20 minutes before you stop and do a cool down. 
This helps with the post-exercise spike. You may even need a correction bolus. Look at the third exercise listed down on my presets. These are pretty important. Lastly, hypo. Don't be eating the stuff on the left. It'll take six years for your blood sugar to come up. You'll overeat and you'll rebound. Eat simple carbs. I love candy corn. And lastly, if you need emergency glucagon kit, we have much better kits. We have Vaximi by Lilly, the Gvoke Systems by Xeris, the syringe and the uh, insulin pen and vial is amazing because you can give yourself a dose that you think you would need. Now, it's not meant for that, but it does have that capability. And then, of course, the easy to use one is the Gvoke HypoPen, just like a EpiPen. If you have one of these old Hypo kits, please get the new one. They also don't expire as fast either, and they're much easier to use. You're not using them, remember? It's someone who's saving your life. So with that, uh, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat box. And there's so much more information in our video vault on our website and the other lectures that we've already uh, filmed and ready to go. So long now.